in the 80s uh, and in the 90s were really uh, in the field of trading. Uh, that, that's why you hear about high frequency trading where people arbitrage within the nanoseconds, uh, you know, of, of financial opportunities. Um, and then it's in tech, which is more, I would say, uh, mobile, uh, individual level type of access to financial services. Um, and then it uh, span into other sectors, uh, including agriculture, health, education, every aspect of life uh, is impacted by, by technology. So it's really the, the, the future. And uh, it's about also the youth because, uh, as I said, uh, you know, passion and, uh, and the intellect is really what drives a lot of things. And uh, the youth today are the ones who have that energy and the passion. And uh, if they choose to, to invest their energy and passion in any area, they can really make a difference. And, and you don't need a lot of them, actually few of them, 10 of them in a country can make a difference. Uh, just think about Mark Zuckerberg and the power he has today. I mean, 20 years ago, he was nobody, or at least uh, he, he went to Harvard too. But uh, then uh, he created a company that nobody can actually control. Now people are talking about regulating it, breaking it up, and, and so forth. So it's important that we actually we really invest in uh, youth and technology, because if few of them succeed, they can make a difference in a country. I think that's really the most important uh, aspect of youth and technology. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to give that, uh, you know, that introduction and then uh, w welcome our first, um, our, our, our first panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Jacob Kwaku Gian, and invite him to give uh, his personal story and then uh, um, we can uh, get the session going. Hello, Hello everybody. My name is Jacob, Jacob Kwekujan. I am 25 years old, but in my home, Accra, Ghana, I run a company that provides top-notch digital and IT services to multinationals, to international corporations, to startups, SMEs, and what have you. Um, life wasn't always like this. I mean, I grew up in the most deprived areas in Accra. My mother was a hawker, and she sold water or anything she could lay her hands on on the streets of Accra. And my father was a mechanic who sold batteries in a mechanic shop. So I spent my childhood with them, selling water on my head or being with my father in the shop. And after junior high school, I actually was a cobbler for some time. So I actually wanted to increase my ability to have TV square meals, basically. And I tried a lot of things. I mean, I tried music for some time, being a footballer for some time. Then I applied for an internship opportunity at a media company. So at the media company, I got taxed to go cover a story. October 2015, the World Bank president came to Ghana to launch the End Poverty Campaign, and I followed the media team. That was the first time I received some substantive amount of money. And so the next week, I heard that the president of Ghana was at another program. I said, I'm going to be there because I needed that money for survival. On my way there, I met a young boy who told me about programming, IT, and I thought it was interesting. I heard about Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs. I thought I could actually change my life if I followed this boy. So I spent days and nights in internet cafes and taught myself how to program and how to be a digital person. And today, I mean, the story is different. In Ghana, I employ over 25 people. The company is doing very well. And for me, if, as Aliu said, if you are looking at investing in young people, my life is evidence of the fact that Investing in digital technologies and impinging the conversation on young people is very, very important. So sometime last year, my team, we visited one of the deprived communities in Accra, and we went there to teach them the skills we have and supported in terms of the taking care of their food because most of these young people are just like me. They have to work before they go to school. And just by doing that, some of them were able to have great, excellent grades and qualified to be in top-notch schools in, in Accra, Ghana. And so when I got the invite to be here, I'm so excited because I am very passionate about young people and technology. Thank you for having me. Now, thank you, Jacob. This was really a, a very passionate uh, uh, so, you know, story about your experience and how you get to where you are today and how you're giving opportunities to other younger people to, um, uh, you know, to, just, just to, to do just what you yourself have, have done. Uh, now I will uh, invite uh, our second uh, 
uh, guest, Ivy Barley, uh, also from Ghana, uh, to, to give us her personal story, um, how she walked towards the podium. She's behind you. Behind me. Okay, Change welcome, Ivy. Perspective. Come. Hello, Go ahead. Everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I love math and computers, but I'm tired of being the only woman in the room. Growing up, I was one of the best students in my school, and so I was getting the, my straight A's. I felt like a celebrity. I thought I had made it in life. But by the time I got to my third year of university, I was now performing poorly in school. I was no longer getting the A's. I was now struggling to get the D's, the E's, and the F's. I felt, dis I felt very depressed, discouraged. I felt I could never make it in life. I even attempted suicide, but I'm glad I'm still alive today. And through this difficult moment of my life, I had two of my lecturers, really amazing women, Professor Adebanji and Professor Ojo. They reached out to me to find out why I was failing in my academics. And they were there to support me, they mentored me, and through their mentorship, I'll say it was very instrumental to my comeback. They even encouraged me to pursue a master's degree in mathematical statistics, which I did and graduated. I'll say I was privileged while growing up because I had access to a computer and internet. I even learned how to um, computer programming on my own. But sadly, this isn't the case for millions of women and girls in Africa. And this is the reason why I started Developers in Vogue, mainly to create the ideal environment for more African women like myself to be interested in technology. We train these women in the latest technologies and connect them to life-changing opportunities in the tech ecosystem. And ladies on our program have gone on to take up job opportunities in companies like Microsoft, the World Bank, Vodafone, and others. Through my work, I've come to the realization that there are many opportunities for youth in Africa. However, the questions I have for you today are how can we position our women and girls to be able to take advantage of these opportunities? How can the government place policies and programs that will be in the best interest of the girl child? And how can industry leaders like you make sure that your work environments are friendly to women? And how can we all ensure that the work we do are reaching women and girls in other represented communities? And this is the reason why I have dedicated my life to invest into a youth and tech-driven future. What about you? The future of technology indeed is African and female. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you for this uh, great story. Um, I, I should say that uh, 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 the angle of a uh, woman and uh, STEM is quite critical. Uh, if you ask me what makes a difference between economies, uh, one, one uh, great difference is how they integrate women because it's more than half of the economy. So if you ignore uh, women or you don't give them the opportunity, you're just actually making your economy less productive mechanically. It's just as simple as that. Uh, the second one is uh, what really drives economy is really innovation, and innovation is driven by science and technology. Of course, there are social, art, and, and many other things, uh, but the main engine and power, I mean, uh, uh, and power of uh, economic growth and so forth comes from, uh, uh, from investing in, uh, in, in, in science and technology, engineering, and, and co. So thank you for all your efforts to bring, in, uh, to give, to bring that to, uh, to, to, to women. Uh, le let me call uh, our last... Uh, our last panelist from Nigeria. Uh, what is he? Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Tochiku, and uh, if you are sitting here and you wanted to be a lawyer when you were young, can you please indicate by raising up your hand? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've not seen any hand. I'm quite curious about this session. If you wanted to be a lawyer, could you please indicate by raising up your hand? Very few. <laughs> okay. So if you, okay, I'll use you for instance. So finally today, <laughs> are you a lawyer? Not, not anymore. So just like you, I wanted to be a lawyer. And 
When I was 10, I was seriously in search of a pathway to success, that I was consuming a lot of information that my age couldn't take. But <laughs> <laughs> then my, my mom bought shares for me with two banks, Access Bank and um, UBA. So I would bring the book, and you know the first few pages has the profile of the directors, right? And I would look at it to know why those guys were selected as the directors from all of their colleagues. So I would see MBA, economics, chartered accountant, and chartered banker, and I'm like, okay, I think this is the way. <laughs> you know, and that was what informed my decision. And most importantly, my dad came back with a newspaper on a certain day, and I flipped it. The first thing I saw was 10,000 lawyers called to buy. And I'm like, 10,000? So much. That's a huge number. Where will I find myself in this? You know, and ultimately, I decided to study economics um, based on the leading of the annual report. Uh, today, I'm also a chartered accountant. Today, I'm also a chartered banker. And the plan worked successfully because the day after I finished my university exam, I got hired by a bank in Nigeria, and I was at the headquarters. So good plan, right? <laughs> But six months into it, I was so full of ideas as a young person. And I wrote to the bank and I asked them to send me to the contact center where people call in for problems. So I spent about three weeks there and I came back to the headquarters uh, with a list of problems and began to push for change within the banking system. And, but it was really difficult. The politics of the whole system was difficult. And um, I decided to exit after six months to start my own company and to start a system I could control. And that was the pivot from the banker, the economist, the accountant dream, and even the, the legal dream into IT. And I looked at the whole space and I decided to solve social problems that exist in our society. And that was how Innovation Corner was born. And today we've worked in healthcare, we've worked in governance, and we are currently doing something that will interest all of us in the room in the area of natural resources to improve the relationship between host companies and natural resource companies, uh, uh, between host communities and natural resource companies using technology. And for each time in life, there has always been a shift from the time that the military defined the might of a country to the time that manufacturing power defined the might of China to the time that technology has defined the might of America and Trump and Huawei and all and the rest of families are now fighting using technology and the future of the world is technology, and who is going to drive that? It's going to be young people, and it is time to invest in young people. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for a thank you. passionate discussion uh, or a, a story about your, uh, what I would say, it's constant change, right? I mean, always wanting to do something different uh, than what you have been uh, asked or predestined to. Um, uh, thank you for the, the three panelists. Uh, we are now complete on the stage. Um, um, uh, I just would like to follow up with each of you and, uh, and uh, ask you uh, one by one uh, your vision and prediction for the future in uh, about 30 seconds. So that I have this number of this time that I have, which I'm sure I, I'm, I'm sure I will uh, not meet, but I'll try. And I ask all each of you to also try. So I'll start with you, the last one to come on stage. OK, great. The, my prediction for the future is a technology-enabled Africa uh, uh, through pub, you know, via public services. And um, what that implies is that a, an African should be able to pay for a bus service with his card. An African should be able to pay for water bills with his card. And what that is going to do is to create uh, uh, an economy for young people that are starting technology businesses. In Nigeria, we have a population of 205 million people, but the active market is 36 million people. So when, when we as young people go out there to pitch to investors to say we have a market size of 205 million, the actual market size is 36 million. But to expand that base, the government and private sector really has to drive technology through public services to increase the people that are willing to adopt technology generally and for that to happen, you know, we have to create a technology-enabled Africa, and that is the future for young people. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jacob? So I'm very, very excited that this year's you know, exchange is in Africa because I think everybody in this room knows that technology is driving the future. But in our part of the world, I mean, if I go back to Ghana, internet penetration, it's not so high. Um, there are people who are even in the very modern cities that do not have access to internet, that do not have computers. And so my prediction of the future is that, you know, countries that pay particular attention and make IT development inclusive in the education process, right, would definitely triumph and, and develop. And we will see the, an improvement in the, um, the standards of living. But if we, we continue the way we are, because, I mean, almost every African country I've visited, the plights are the same, uh, similar problems. And, I mean, I, I was talking about the fact that just last year, we went to a very deprived school that none, nobody has ever passed from that school before. Doesn't mean that the kids there are not intelligent. Doesn't mean that they cannot be as smart as the others. But just because they do not have access to computers, just because they have to work and go to school, but just the, the, the mere gesture of helping them by giving them you know, support in terms of you, wanna, you don't have to go and sell, come to school, you get food, and then giving them computers, teaching them programming and all that. These kids had excellent grades that people who are living in very, very comfort zones, you know, attending very, very good schools, couldn't have. So my prediction of the future is that we have to, you know, if we do not pay particular attention to youth development and impinge that kind of conversation on, you know, the young people having IT skills, digital skills, you know, it, it would be a problem. But if we do, then definitely the future is bright. Because IT is actually here, I mean, technology is here to make our lives better. So we have to pay particular attention to making it more inclusive in our education process. Thank you. You're slightly above 30 seconds, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, Ivy, your turn. Um, here today to represent the women and girls in Africa, I have seen how education and technology has transformed my life. And if I'm to make a prediction, um, concerning technology in Africa, I see and I want to shape an Africa where more women and girls like myself will be daring enough to be leaders in science, technology, engineering and mathematics fields. Um, in the next five to ten years, I want to see the greater percentage of women becoming producers of technology and not just consumers of it. I want it to get to a point where we will be known not just for taking great selfies, but knowing how to build game-changing innovations, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this passionate uh, prediction and uh, hope for the future. Um, the last question for all of you, and here I'll start with you, Ivy. Uh, um, you know, you have a captive audience here, and uh, if you were to tell everyone in this room one thing you want them to do, either during the exchange or when they go back uh, uh, to their offices and their, 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 you know, their daily life, what would it be? Um, sorry, I have just three and they are very short. Okay, as long as it's 50 <laughs> to 30 seconds, so we are, you, you can take it. <laughs> and so one, I would say it really starts from our homes, um, as parents, as siblings. Let's socialize our girls and our boys equally. Let's give equal opportunities to our girls and our boys. And let's, let's not have, give the girls a mindset that they cannot be what they want to be. And as employers, um, it's very important that we make our workplaces diverse and inclusive. Um, for women, make sure you are paying your women well. Make sure that you are giving them the promotion they deserve. And then finally, if you are here and you feel you don't have much to offer, I just want to encourage you today that even on your way to work, the girl you see on the street who seems like there's actually no hope for her, you can just take a few minutes to encourage her, tell her that her dreams are possible, tell her that she can be anything she wants to be. No, thank you. Thank you. So I will skip the second Ghanaian, I'll go to a Nigerian first. <laughs> <laughs> Nigerians are everywhere, you know, she's Nigerian there. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, you know, it's really about taking action. Um, this is like three days, 
you know, and you're going to have very sparking conversations. It's important for us to take action. Um, so that is what I would encourage us to do. Take action within your communities, take action within your companies or your societies generally, so that most of the conversations here would come to life. Um, most importantly is that within your ecosystem, uh, you need to create opportunities for, for young people when you go back to, your, to where you control. Reason is that none of us would have been stood here today without one instrumental system or person. You know. So the program that got me into the bank was a new program and apparently I had positioned myself and I was able to get that. But if that program didn't exist, I wouldn't be seated here today. So you create systems and programs that would accept bringing young people into your system. And most importantly, what made me to leave the bank is because um, you know, there was not a, a system to accommodate ideas to flow. So it's important that while you bring in young people into the system, you don't just take pictures and say you're welcome to our organization. Um, it's important for you to create a system for them to thrive in that organization and lead innovation because they are the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. So I think this is the most important part of the conversation. And um, I hope I do 30 seconds. So after learning programming, it took me over a year to get my first job because nobody gave me the chance. I go to hotels, I write my name on a sheet of paper, my number, and I tell people I could build an app for you, build a website for you. They tell me, okay, they give me their number, I call, they don't answer, or they just snub <laughs> you for a whole year because I didn't have any formal education, I didn't understand how the corporate system works. You know, I had nobody to help me. One day I went to a church in Accra because I thought the rich people would be there and I met one, one person. I told him I could build apps and then he said, okay, take my card. He was CEO of Dell, country director of Dell at the time and he gave me my first job. Four years down the line, a lot of people in my community are benefiting from me. So as he said, let's take action. Let's believe in young people. Let's give them a chance. I was about 20 years at the time. So you could imagine, people see you and think this hungry boy is about to pester me. So <laughs> give, them, give us an opportunity and help us because the future indeed belongs to young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just curious. You said you were 20 at the time. Yes. I, I thought you were 20 now. <laughs> <laughs> you look 20 now. <laughs> I'm 25 now. Uh, it's okay. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank you for your passionate stories and your passionate call to action. Uh, you know, I have few people that I really uh, think, you know, have put things into powerful quotes that I would like to use in my closing uh, remarks. Um, when I was much younger, I used to read, uh, I, I didn't study economics, so I just read to, to, be, to seem a bit more cultured in, in my environment. <laughs> Uh, and one of the, my, my authors, the f uh, you know, favorite authors was uh, Lester Churov. He was the dean of MIT. Uh, very, very uh, you know, well-known economist, but the interesting thing about his books is that there is no formula. So I like the, the, you know, to read the, the books. And one of the quotes he says is that, um, without entrepreneurs, economies become poor and weak. The old will not exit and the new can't enter. So really giving people who are entrepreneurs in their you know, heart the opportunity uh, to develop whatever ideas and passion they have uh, is really what drives economies. Um, because those people really shape the future, the present and the future. And that to me is uh, just something that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, and the second one is really uh, if it's something that a lot of them, uh, you know, uh, refer to, um, and I really truly believe in that. Um, somebody asked Warren Buffett, "How does he chooses choose his uh, his associate and employees?" And he said he looks for three things: um, integrity, intellect, and drive. Okay. Um, and then he added, actually, that second part, which is also very relevant. He said, "If the first one is missing." then the, 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 the other two will kill you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think it's important to, you know, 
it's not about integrity per se, it's really values. And I think, you know, sustainability, exchange, and development is really about values, if you think of it, you know, hard. It's really about sharing and uh, giving back to your know, community what you have learned as a professional, as an entrepreneur, and, and, and so forth. So I really believe in those things. And the second aspect of it is that intellect is the only thing that is universally equally spread, okay? It's just the environment and the opportunities that makes a difference for each of us sitting in this room. Um, and uh, if you are lucky enough uh, to be in a nice environment, you can make it. Uh, if you're lucky enough to meet with somebody like your uh, Dell CEO to give you opportunity to follow your passion, then you, know, you can make it and hopefully you can also do the same thing for, for other people. And then drive is really about energy and passion and everything. So uh, in my closing remarks, I would say, that, as I started, the future is going to be about the youth. Uh, it's going to be about uh, technology. And it's going to be also making sure that every part of our society and economies uh, participate in economic activity and share equally uh, in the burdens, but also in the, uh, in the, uh, in the profits. Um, and I'm really referring to, to uh, women, uh, because if you are excluding half of your population, actually more than half of your population, you, you just cannot compete you know, with the rest of the world. It's just not possible. So my call to action is really you know, invest in the youth, give them the opportunity, we just need a computer somewhere in a village. They can make a difference and make sure that you also uh, share that, uh, give that opportunity to women uh, to participate in uh, our development um, um, agenda. So thank you, everyone. And thank, uh, thank you. you for our panelists. Uh, give them uh, a very good round of uh, applause. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much, Aliyu and Ivy. Tuchu and Jacob, they are setting the bar high, huh? So far, what we've heard today. I feel woke, I feel inspired. And what we're hearing now, it's time for a little refresh. Because you've heard so much that we need a moment to process, right? So many brilliant ideas, so many authentic stories and insights. So I invite up on stage back Numakunda and Mamika Note for a few minutes while we also pass some fruit so that you can get a little vitamin C, a little refresher as we transition to the next session. So please enjoy this one selection. We will start again in four minutes. The fruit is coming. Thank you. Please. Good 
Ade Adama Aisata Ilimajire Toro da Samagai Jaman Mes amis, ce nous harit, total, total, asseyez-vous. I want you to know, Mama, I who here has seen the movie Black Panther? Raise your hand if you've seen Black Panther. Black Panther. My friend here, she sings on the soundtrack of Black Panther. Okay, this is epic. And we thank you so much for your beautiful voice and bringing your gifts to us. And Numokunda, we thank you. Thank you so much. So come on back. We're going to get started. Nungi dem legi legi Kai Kai sumaharit Kai togal Come and have a seat We're starting again 
We have unleashed the passion. I can, I can tell you're excited. But we're going to get started. And this whole two days, it's going to move quickly like this. Like technology, like young people, we're going to be moving fast. And I invite the panelists, the next speakers, to come on stage. So I invite Linda and her team to come on stage. Come on back. Bring your coffee. Bring your food. Bring your drinks. We're like family now. We can eat together. So come on and have a seat. Come on up, folks. Thank you. You can adjust your chairs to be most comfortable. And as we're getting settled, I just want to remind us that we are here to innovate, to try new things, to do things differently, because more of the same is not going to get us to where we're trying to go. We're passing out fruit, we're bringing in music, we're acting a little crazy. Innovation happens at the intersections. It's when we bring different disciplines, different people, different backgrounds, all together. And we listen to each other. So come on in. We're starting now. I don't think this And everyone's, we've got to keep the train moving no, on no, time. No, 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 exactly. no. I called. So Linda, my dear, I am going to turn this over to you and we are going to get started. Thank you so much. Does it work? Yeah, start. Hello? Yes. Hold it. Hey, sweetie. Hello? Hi, everyone. We are going to get started. Okay. Uh, is it on? It's not easy after the break. Yeah. What is the next session? Merci. That's very intimidating. <laughs> I didn't need it. I'm feeling scared. <laughs> it's weird sitting around. <laughs> Hi. Raja. Oh. Sorry for that. While we're getting started, look across the room. See somebody okay. you want to talk to later. Because after this, we're having a coffee break. Make eye contact. Point to them. Okay. Say, I want to meet you at the coffee after. This is all about connecting. Don't be passive. Jump right in. OK, I see you. I see you. We're talking later. OK. OK, so I want to talk to you too, sir. We have a plan. Just talk to Okay, welcome everybody. I think it's a hard act to follow the singer of Black Panther, but I'm sure you'll find our session quite exciting. So this is my second conference in two weeks, hence the loss of my voice. Um, and in addition to losing my voice, I also lost my luggage. So I think it's a sign from the universe to do things differently. Um, so maybe next year I will send my AI a virtue person to attend, then I can stay at home and be in my pyjamas attending. But anyway, my name is Linda Munyengatera. I'm with the IFC. I am the Director for Infrastructure for Africa and Middle East. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session um, with my esteemed um, panelists. So to get started, what are we talking about today? Making waves, energy transitions and trade-offs um, is the topic of today. So really, before we launch, just to um, set the scene, I'm just going to ask the panelists a couple of questions before I introduce them. Um, and we, we had a little debate on trilemma, and you will get to learn a little bit more about what trilemma is all about. So the question to the panelists is, um, in this trilemma era, what are you prepared to give up? And the options are air conditioning, Meat and dairy, 
or business cards. So, starting with Mamadou. I mean, good morning, everybody. The first thing that I will not leave is this panel. I'm, I'm a lucky man in front of so nice ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this will not give up. But what I, what I will give up maybe is, is the business card, maybe to save more, uh, let's say, more trees in the world. And what? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave up the business cards easily. And I think we can also leave, leave up the air <laughs> um, And Sophie? Uh, I think I can also give up on business cards. Uh, air conditioning, well, in the UK, is not particularly necessary. <laughs> and Susan? Thanks. I'm going to give a different answer. Uh, we were talking about the environment recently with my family and, and three kids at home. We watched David Attenborough's great program on, on Netflix, and we decided to give up meat for a month. And it was hard, but we uh, learned lots of new recipes. So I'll go for the meat and dairy. Well, there's a challenge for you people out there if you want to save the footprint of the world. Maybe give up meat for a month and see what happens. Raja? Um, I'd say plastics. I'm trying to avoid as much um, use of plastics in my life as possible. After seeing the Attenborough you know, <laughs> documentary as well, given how much goes into oceans. Fantastic. I think we should send a link of this video because it sounds like we may actually all learn something that's good for the environment. And with that, I just want to formally introduce the panelists. So we have um, Mamadou Gumbele, who is Vice President Africa Energy uh, Business for Watsala. We have Maud Danal Fadu, and she is the Project Director assigned to the CEO for Eranov Group. And we have um, N. Sophie Kobo, and she is the Head of Gas Analyst Analysis at BP. Also, Susan um, Chanon. And she is the VP, Government Relations, Policy and International Organizations for Shell. And finally, but not least, we have Raja. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Jan Jandiala. Jandiala. And she's the founder and president of Yatra Ventures. And with that, welcome everybody and thank you so much for your time. Um, I will launch straight into the questions. Um, and sorry, give me a second. And in fact, maybe before I launch into the questions, just maybe to give you a little bit of a um, background as to what this is about. So the World Energy Council summed it up um, quite simply as energy transition is a trilemma. So that means it it's, um, encompasses energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability. All three need to be balanced. And that is quite a significant challenge for any person or for any country or for any company, which is why we have all these different representatives with us here today to see if this nut can be cracked. So, um, starting with Anne Sophie, the question for you is, what are the primary drivers behind this transition? Is it a response to country requirements, market forces, oil prices, cheaper solar? Um, financing opportunities, what is it? Why are we going through this transition? So at BP, we often talk about the dual challenge. I mean, the world will need more energy. There are about one billion people who don't have access to electricity, three billion people who don't have access to clean cooking. So there is this force. I mean, the additional energy demand is driven by increase of population, but also increase of income. I mean, people having better prosperity. But at the same time, we all know that we have to decrease CO2 emissions. I am part of the group economics, and we are quite famous because we do the energy outlook. So in our last energy outlook, which was published in February, we look at a rapid transition scenario, a scenario which would be compatible with meeting the Paris Agreement. And let me tell you one thing, there is not a unique solution to meeting the Paris Agreement. It's everything. It's, of course, renewables are very important. And in that scenario, we have renewable growing to 30% of the primary energy mix. I mean, if you compare to the history of any single energy source, it has never been achieved. But renewable, this is for electricity. And we have a lot of different sectors which will need to be decarbonized. So you need to look at transport. You need to look at industry, at residential buildings, air conditioning. You need to look at all these sectors so you need to have more energy efficiency, you need to have circular economy, you need to have clean energy sources, whether it's renewable, it's hydro, it's nuclear, or you use carbon capture, utilization, and storage. 
you need to have maybe new energy vectors like hydrogen, biofuels. So it's everything together. And it's also a matter that governments, consumers, that's all of us here, and energy companies need to tackle together. So if there is one thing that you need to remember, it's not a single solution, it's everything, absolutely every single sector, and all fuels have to contribute. Thanks, and Sophie. So it sounds like um, the, the transition is really about all of us, and not only about the big corporates or the, what the government can do, but what I myself can do. So if it's about you know reducing your plastics or not eating meat, that is a contribution to not consuming too much energy and maybe also helping us shift to renewable energy. So I'm going to move to um, Suzanne. And um, just as a reminder, Suzanne is from Shell. And the question for you is, what does industry need from the governments to make the necessary investments? At the moment, there is a ping pong between all the stakeholders, basically government and the, and the developers. Um, the government saying that industry is not doing enough, and industry saying that the government is not providing the right policies and frameworks to enable industry to do enough. What's your response to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, repeating a little bit what Anne Sophie said, the, the big picture is that between now and 2050, there will be two billion more people on our planet. Energy demand will rise by 30% or more, and the world needs to have its. CO2 emissions, so that's a, a, a massive challenge. So we need to reduce what we're using, we need to decarbonise the products we do use, and we will need to mitigate, so there will be some emissions that, that are still required long after that. What, what industry really needs is a stable economic and a stable policy environment. The investments you make in the energy system are investments for decades, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So what industry really needs is that certainty of policy frameworks. And let me just say a couple of things which help us make those investments in the, in the cleaner fuels. Um, and, and when we talk about stable policy environments, we aren't just talking about the power sector. As Anne Sophie said, the, the power sector is only a small part of the overall energy sector. So it's heat, it's agriculture, it's buildings, it's transport. But at the heart of that, if there was one thing that governments could do longer term, it would be around introducing a carbon price. And carbon pricing has been a, a debate for many years, of course. I believe the debate today is a, a more constructive one around how do you have a, a just transition and how are the revenues from any carbon pricing system used to ensure that we have a, a just transition, that it isn't um, just recycled in a way that, for example, benefits industry. Um, so carbon price is, is critical. The, the other thing which is really critical, and we touched on it this morning, is, is innovation, so real policies around scaling up innovation to the uh, commercial level. So there's loads of great ideas, lots of um, startups, but often they, they don't get through that middle stage of development. So policies that, that really help scale. Um, and lastly, implementation of the Paris Agreement. So I believe there is about 11 governments out of the 157 or so who have signed up to the Paris Agreement who have actually come forward with long-term strategies around how they will meet those goals. So it's easy to commit to a goal. How you will get there is much more challenging. So the implementation of that through the Paris rule book is, is really critical. But more than anything else, and I'm probably almost at time, we actually need collaboration. We need collaboration between government and industry. Climate and the energy transition is, is not an issue of the right or the left of industry or of government. Everybody needs to come together to, to tackle this, this huge challenge and to talk about it in an in integrated way. So we as a company can't put renewable fuel into a car that comes to our petrol stations, which is an internal combustion engine. We can't put hydrogen yet into an aeroplane. So you really need to have everybody in the supply chain working together on both the supply side, i.e. the stuff that we give to industry, and on the, the pull side, the, the demand side from industry. So my message is around collaboration. Thank you, Susan. I would have so many questions to ask following that, but um, we'll move on and let the audience maybe, you know, um, put a bookmark at that one and see if they can um, ask you some questions later. Maud, um, so which element of the trilemma is top of your mind um, in your industry and how do your respective businesses cater to one or all three? Okay. 
Uh, for us, it, it will be mostly three. Um, my focus will be today mostly on, uh, on Africa. And I said I would speak in French and we would be both to speak in French. So I will, I will switch to French. Uh, J'aimerais en préambule amener quelques chiffres. Uh, in préambule, I would like to uh, bring some no new figures on the trillium uh, of electricity in Africa. First of all, uh, in the problem of availability, one African person out of two has an, doesn't have access to electricity today. You know, from um, the third uh, angle, um, the second angle of this triangle, it's the price, the price of the kilowatt per hour it varies from one country to the other. It's not impossible to generalize um, and say um, electricity is um, cheaper or more expensive in Africa. It depends on the energetic mix and the level of subsidies. But we were able to see in our activity in, um, in Africa, we've been able to have the customers and um, consumers are sensitive to these um, price variations. It uh, has a direct impact on the budgets of the households. On an angle of the triangle, sustainability, therefore. With regard to sustainability, we have three ways to look at things. First, the first one, the sensitiveness and vulnerability of the African continent and more particularly for sub-Saharan countries and to the energetic transition and ecological challenges. I think that um, everyone is aware of that. Um, and the second aspect, um, it's about, um, about some relative figure, figures. Um, um, Sub-Saharan Africa represents only 2% of um, the uh, releases um, and uh, and um, CO2 releases uh, will be um, up to 4% uh, within uh, uh, some more years. Um, so it's uh, something uh, really low as compared to the rest of the world. But it's a relative figure. If the Sub-Saharan Africans change their way to consume, we uh, would realize that um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's um, 0 0.8 tons uh, per year. And for the European, um, for the Americans, it's 16.4%. Um, if Africa changes um, their the way of um, consuming um, energy, the uh, problem we have at the world level the, would uh, turn into a tragedy. In conclusion, the problematic in Africa, um, it is extremely strong. We need to keep the same level of uh, gas release per inhabitant while uh, giving access to all Africans to electricity. And um, this uh, at an affordable cost in, in a fragile economic context. When we talk about uh, affordable costs, the um, price of electric electricity should be very low. Uh, as far as I know, this type of model doesn't exist. We need to create it. And in, in Iran, now, we believe that this energetic model, endogenous model, will be created in Africa. I think it's, um, it's extremely difficult to um, actually balance um, how we can get that triangle um, balanced. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work and a lot of thinking that needs, to be go, that needs to go into figuring out how to make that work without having Africa being left behind, especially when we're talking about um, access to energy for all. I'm going to turn to Raja now. And um, Raja, the question for you is, have you noticed trends in the types of investors in the energy transition space? Have investors changed over the last five years? And if so, what are they, um, what are they looking for now? And um, what role does Yatra or investors play in shaping the trilemma? Um, I mean, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, if, um, I also have a bit of a recovery from a, a bad cold, um, so I might sound uh, like I'm uh, talking a book, rate, a book on a book on tape kind of thing. And the other thing that I've been worried about all morning, and I shouldn't be, is I only dressed for a 180 degree view and not a 360 degree view this morning. <laughs> and so I've been like uh, obsessed by this round thing that I've not been on before. Um, so, uh, I mean, maybe before to answer that question, one of the things is a little bit about um, our company. So, and what 
we are trying to do. Um, and I really love the session that we had before with the young people because I founded my company with a 25-year-old because when I left my last job, um, I had that Jerry Maguire moment, packing up all my things and saying, anybody coming with me? And my intern said, I'll come with you. <laughs> so his name is Stefan Mba. He, his parents are Cameroonian immigrants to the United States. I just wanted to give him a shout out because he has another job I probably shouldn't uh, have mentioned his name but anyway uh, that's how life goes um, I for me the a little bit of the transition and the trilemma um, I had been in the war to peace transition on the con in, in Africa uh, over the last 25 years and transitions any transition are simply have three challenges one is institutions countries institutions are the biggest uh, I think a challenge when when it doesn't matter what the transition is, whether it's war to peace or whether it's tra energy transitions. Do the institutions have the capacities and the human capital? The other bit is time frames. You know, a transition can be a three-year transition, a five-year transition, a ten-year transition. And governments really have to break time frames down for their populations to really understand, hey, the first three years you may not see results, but this is what we're going to see in order to look at it a longer term. So we always look for national development plans that say, you know, what is your vision time frame for these transitions? Um, and the other principle that we deal with is um, we are partners of public sector. Uh, we want to own things jointly with the public sector. So we right now uh, are in a joint equity partnership with the government of Uganda to build the East Africa refinery based in Oima. And you could ask why, how a four-year-old firm uh, competed with 40 global firms to be selected to be the government partner. So in that sense, I think that the three issues we faced uh, was the government's in Governments are the biggest early capital investors in infrastructure across the globe. Uh, it's not new. They do the land, they do the studies, uh, they, uh, they do all of the initial early stage investments. Now how they go from that in early stage investments to the next stage is, is the transition. That's another transition that constantly happens. So for us, um, in that question of investors, everybody told me, you're crazy to go, f you're crazy to even offer the solution of building this refinery in East Africa. And we said, look, from a private sector point of view, it's a public, it's goods and services, right? The engineering, the lawyers, the, the studies, how to make it commercially viable is what the com private sector looks for. But in our case, we said, let's look at what the government of Uganda is looking at. I'm just giving this as an example because we have other projects. They were maxed out on their credit cards, as I call it, uh, both the public sector credit card and the multilateral credit card and the bilateral credit card. And so what we said is, why don't we offer you a solution where we take you to the investors? Uh, and why don't we jointly own something together so you can explain to your stakeholders the external investment partners are not taking advantage of you in a critical value chain that you consider will get you to become a middle income country. So our principle was we agree with you, you have a value chain that's going to get you to middle income by 2028 20, at the moment or 2030. Uh, and it's $200 more that you need per GDP. How can this sector and this can help you achieve that? So for us, we face three types of investors. Government is an investor and the regional equity partners as investors. They've all agreed to take an equity position. Uh, we face owners of capital um, as investors. The biggest challenge we face, to be very honest, is the perception of risk uh, by all investors. The public sector investors saying, how do we know, at least when we borrow, we control what comes to us and what we spend. And then the public sector and the private sector investors that say, you know what, is it in the right location? Is it, and there are a thousand questions we go to. So for us, all transitions are, are 
difficult. It doesn't matter what it is. It's war to peace, energy transition, especially in Uganda or the East Africa, where 95% of the population still uses wood uh, at charcoal. So for me, whether it's Paris Agreement or all the other frameworks that are around the world, if you don't get that percentage of population off um, and importing it 100% and cutting 95% of your trees down, that's the bigger solution we're trying to provide. So it's been, it's, um, it, investors are just um, a, a, a bigger question of what's the alignment between returns and the risk and the public good. Right. Thanks very much. And um, Mamadou, I didn't forget you. Like your question is the same as Maud's question, which is essentially, um, what, which element of the trial am I top of your mind um, for, your, for your company or for your industry? And how do your respective businesses cater? Or how does your business cater to one or all of the trial am Okay, then, <coughs> then as a mode, I will reply in French, because we, we said we will get in French. Uh, en fait, il faut voir que tous les trois... Actually, we need to realize that all three elements are important. I, um, we talked about uh, technologies and facts. Uh, but uh, we've had uh, several uh, programs demonstrating that the cost of energy, the solar energy, uh, wind energy, is uh, become quite affor affordable, and uh, will, that will necessarily need to a change of paradigm. Now we have, have some kind of uh, conventional electricity with all sorts of engines and so on. And uh, the wind um, energy is going to be added, but with this low cost, we will change the paradigm. And uh, well, we'll have the, the renewable uh, component as a base element. But there's also another important fact to be aware of in, uh, when it comes to energy. Energy consumed must equal the quantities produced. You cannot have a difference between what is produced and what is consumed. This, um, either we produce too much and uh, the frequency plays a role, and uh, oh, you don't um, um, produce enough and the um, um, uh, network crosses down. That's why um, uh, in, the, in the can different countries we have so often these power cuts. Um, and the, lot, the effect of having a lot of new, um, renewable energy causes some other different types of problems, but all these three pillars should be taken uh, into account to have some kind, some kind of a cohesive uh, and efficient um, energy production system. In all these countries, we um, are carrying out some modeling work right now. I think there are many countries uh, looking into their energy, energy mix uh, and see how to balance the gas to power um, uh, type of um, uh, energy production system and uh, we each individual country which have their own individual ecosystem and their own models and uh, and we are more going for a model uh, which consists in having, having some sort of cohesive approach for each individual country I'd also add that with the excess production solar with solar energy for example in those countries the solar energy production is not cohesive um, in relation uh, to the um, uh, consumption we have problem uh, storage, and um, in some countries, people are, we are talking about producing some kind of synthetic gas from the energy produced during the day that is available and is not consumed. This is how we see things. We realize that we need to carry out very complex studies for individual countries, and depending on the resources available. Some, depending on the country of sunlight that we have in the country. Thank you, Merci Mamadou. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of education that needs to be done, um, especially to the government, so that they can make informed decisions, because I think um, without sort of the right um, parties helping them think through all of these different options, it's very easy to make mistakes. And as somebody said earlier on, you know, when you invest in an energy system, it's a, it's a long-term investment, so it needs to be done right. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to go back to Susan um, and speak a little bit about um, Shell and the fact that you know your company is is known for its um, oil and gas and it's, it's built on oil and gas. Um, how have your models evolved in the last years to focus on changing market dynamics and global country needs 
and how are you balancing the trilemma, if at all? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so first of all, before I answer the question, I was, I was yesterday at our technology center in Amsterdam and uh, some of our R&D teams were explaining a project we have to try and turn chicken poo into energy. So we are expanding, like many people, well beyond what people would think of as a traditional oil and gas. But let me say a couple of words about what we're saying, but more importantly, what we're doing as a, as a company. Um, Shell is a company which is made up in its DNA of, of Dutch engineers and Scottish accountants, so we're very good at crunching numbers, not always so good at the emotional side of things, but, but our analysis, which will come as no surprise to, to people here, show that, and I am not an engineer, there is only about 15% of the emissions used from getting the stuff out of the ground, 85% of it, the vast majority, comes from using the products. So we have concluded that the best way we can contribute to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement and to engaging in the energy transition is to not only address our own emissions, which are, are really important, but also help our customers to address theirs. So what does that mean in practice? It means that we are investing a huge amount of money in uh, new energies, so that is new fuels, it's power, solar, renewables. It is also access to energy, so there is a huge opportunity as people have talked, to, talked about here in terms of connecting people. We've committed to connecting 100 million customers by 2030 who do not currently have, have access to energy. It is about gas, so using gas not only in power but also in, in transport, in marine, gas to uh, liquids. There's many uses for gas and, and Sophie talked about, uh, about those. And of course, we, we do need to address our own emissions. So you have this bit about reducing our own emissions, helping our customers to decarbonize theirs, which will rapidly help us over the coming decades to, to change our, our portfolio, largely a story about uh, fuels, about electrification. There will also be a part of emissions which are very difficult to abate and which will need to be mitigated. And, and so as a company, we are looking at how you can do that using sinks, and that is both carbon capture and storage, but also natural sinks. So we, we have announced that we'll invest about 300 million over the coming years in, in nature-based solutions, and that is not as an excuse for continuing with some of the heavier, more, more polluting forms. It is to offer our customers who aren't yet ready to buy electric cars, or we talked a little bit about the, the price of the transition, to, to offer them an, uh, a, a way to mitigate some of their emissions. So, so there's a, a big opportunity to invest in, in nature as well. Um, so, so that is a little bit about what we are saying. We will reduce by about half our carbon intensity over the, the coming decades and invest in, in many of those new technologies, scale up those that exist. In terms of the, the business models, um, we really need, as I talked about earlier, the policy frameworks. We need innovative financing models. So when I think about access to energy, the, the traditional model is a big power plant with lots of little lines going out. We have started to invest in some of the off-grid, the small-scale solar uh, here in Africa and, and elsewhere. We have a number of equity positions. So we need those models to change. And, and we're kind of building the plane as we're flying here in the energy transition. So that's where I, I come back to the point about collaboration and, and working together and trying and in some cases failing. Thank you. And I guess innovation is at the center of all of that and everybody has to put on their thinking caps and be imaginative. And it's a good segue to um, the next question which is for, for Anne-Sophie and that is gas. What is the role of gas and renewables? And um, where does that leave oil? Are we done with oil? It's a very good question. And obviously, I mean, I am I'm the gas person, so I mean, <laughs> I, I have a natural love for natural gas. I've been working on natural gas for maybe 20 years now. And I started on hydrogen, by the way. I mean, I was very early in my time. But at BP, I mean, 
We are seen a traditional oil and gas company like Shell, but we do also invest in renewable. I mean, people tend to forget that there was a time about 15, 20 years ago where BP was beyond petroleum. So we were already very early investors in solar and wind. Well, probably a bit too early, but we are back. I mean, and we do propose a panel of energies, but. To come back to your question on gas and renewable, as I mentioned, I mean, there is definitely a strong role for renewable, and I fully agree with Mamadou. I mean, the decrease in terms of cost has been tremendous and now allows for both solar and wind to compete, I mean, depending on the location, but they are becoming more and more competitive energies, and we do see a role for them. But the thing is that it can only grow that much every year. Last year it was plus 14%. It was about additional 300 terawatt hours, but this is gigantic, and you need to do that every single year. So it calls for a lot of investment in all the countries. And when people talk about natural gas and renewable, there is this very strong complementarity because renewable, for all their qualities, they're intermittent. So if there is no wind or during the night, there is no solar, well, you still need energy. And this is where gas, which is a, a cleaner burning fuel, can help. So you have this very nice complementarity. But natural gas is not only about power generation. As I mentioned, I mean, industry is also a very strong pillar of growth for natural gas demand. People tend to forget, I mean, industry as a sector is a huge component of total primary energy demand. This is already half of primary energy demand, and we estimate that the growth of the industrial sector is going to contribute to about a third of the additional energy demand. So industry is really a key sector where there is already a strong position for coal. So you're asking me, where does that leave oil? So it's kind of different story. I mean, oil, people tend to think oil, it's cars. Do you know how much, what's the contribution of cars in total oil demand? it's only 20%. 20 million barrels per day out of 100 million barrels per day. So even if you transform everything and you have only EVs, you're only removing 20 million barrels per day. Total transport, so cars, trucks, aviation, maritime, rail, that's about 55%. And then you have pet chem, so the plastics, but not only, I mean, the single-use plastics that everybody is so focusing on. I mean, uh, we see plastic everywhere, our computers, etc. So that's also something that we need to think of. So oil, even if you were to completely remove uh, 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 all the cars, which is, I mean, quite tremendous, I mean, would not decrease that much. In our, mo I mean, in the, in the scenario that I mentioned before, the rapid transition scenario, we have oil demand decreasing to about 80 million barrels per day. And this is with a lot of EVs. We have about 650 million EVs. This is with electrification of some sectors. This is with using more biofuels in aviation, etc. This is with stringent measures on the pet chem. But you only get there. And if we were to completely stop investing right now in oil fees, in new oil fees, then according to the IEA, the supply of oil will decrease by 4.5% per year. So we will go down by 2040 to 35 million barrels per day. So the gap between the scenario where we are pretty much in line with the Paris Agreement, so 80 million barrels per day by 2040, and where we will be without any investment, that's about 40 million barrels per day. So that's investment which is necessary, because otherwise, I mean, you have to tell everybody, well, stop using your car, stop shipping goods, everywhere, stop producing computers and a lot of the stuff that we are using in all our life regularly. So I think there is a bit of misunderstanding about oil and where oil demand is coming from and how easily and rapidly it can be replaced. Right. Um, and maybe just a follow-on question on that, because oil is a significant part of, um, of the African energy sector. What, what's your view on that? Do you have any... I mean, I, 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 again, we are, we are looking at uh, different scenarios, but we still see a growing role for oil, maybe not so much in the power generation sector, but definitely in transport, because I mean, there are two billion people, 
And I mean, these people need to move around, and you need to also move uh, the goods, and you, you have also uh, shipping, etc. So I mean, it's not going to disappear. But we also do see a strong role for natural gas and for renewable. And as I mentioned, for natural gas, it's on, not only about power to gas, uh, gas to power, sorry, <laughs> but also about industry, because this continent is going to grow a lot in terms of economic growth. And industry is going to be part of that growth. And for industry, you need also fuels. So gas, given that we have gas in a lot of places in Africa, can be a solution to fuel that economic growth. Great, thank you. And Maud, coming back to you. So Aronoff um, is the only company around this table that is involved in the energy distribution. Um, how do you see the role of the consumer evolving with the transitions? Um, and how is the end user affected? And what is the role of the consumer? And finally, I know it's a lot of questions. <laughs> how is your company responding to the new consumer and the evolving needs of the consumer in this triangle? Hello. Uh, well, uh, Susan was saying that the consumer is during consumption that the CO2 is released. So we have responsibility, which is very powerful as an energetician, to sensitize customers and to bring them into being more responsible in their consumption. Uh, this sensitization is done very easily because customers are very responsive. They're very interested in consuming less uh, energy because this um, um, brings to savings in the portfolio of uh, households and industries at large. Uh, so um, uh, we can see that in a system which is uh, very listening, which is uh, uh, very... Uh, so what are we, are we doing? We've done some sensitization campaigns uh, targeting our customers. These campaigns are handled by uh, utility companies. The other interventions, uh, the other actions in, in the customer agency for sale of electricity, we're selling products that allow consumers to consume less energy and to improve their um, carbon footprint. So, um, uh, energy um, savers, e hybrid equipments are provided, LED lamps, low consumption LED lamps, a small instrument that will allow them to better calculate their consumption and uh, to control their consumption and to consume less energy. And I'm missing some, anyway. So the other action point. Now we're trying to push toward having, toward leapfrogging. We are expecting that we hope may arrive in Africa thanks to the combination of creative minds, of consumers, with innovations that will be low and high tech, uh, thanks to youth, which is um, very uh, uh, business minded, and also thanks uh, to energeticians of our of this kind. And we believe that all these combined energies, um, uh, in view of climate emergencies, may, this may allow Africa to truly change its uh, consumption uh, habits in a very dra dramatic, drastic manner. So. In the meantime, there's another point, um, because we're talking about the cost of uh, carbon emissions, the trilemma you've been talking about. You have the issue of access, which is also vital, I was saying, and one out of two Africans don't have access to electricity. This is one of our big focus areas for, for to change things. We have to increase the production of uh, electricity. We do believe, um, uh, we believe in hydroelectricity, which is a decarbonated uh, electricity, which, is, which now represents outside South Africa, which represents 70% of uh, the capacity of production of the African continent. This is a true source of production. This is a true alternative. It, this is an energy which is not very expensive, expensive compared to others. We believe in gas and combined cycle will uh, allow them to provide rapid solutions, uh, not expensive, with an increase of level of production. The, the networks, the grid. So once we have produced, you have to uh, transport that electricity and networks we talk about in limited networks and grids. So in, in the networks, we have to increase the grids and line on production and that efficient has to be beefed up also. In Africa, 12% of losses, um, technical losses uh, in electrical grids. So, so this 12% of uh, uh, electric that is loss we have to work on that efficiency of grids and on the efficiency of uh, 
non technical losses and fraud also the element limit fraud because fraud is a very important element um, in the price in um, uh, in the cost in of electricity uh, the person who pays you know um, that electricity is also covering um, uh, those losses um, so at the end of the day the very last link of that electricity is the consumer and access to the last link of the chain this access we talked about off-grid uh, um, um, and uh, true, uh, this is a very important part of the solution. But on the on grid, uh, there is a very important element. Um, great um, barrier to the entry is the price of connection to uh, the network, to the grid. Now, for a new consumer, um, um, for example, a home that wants to consume electricity uh, using the grid, the cost to install the equipment and that may be three or four times the average income of a household this entry barrier is very um, important so now uh, in our group in Cote d'Ivoire in partnership with the uh, government we have developed a program called uh, electricity for all which allows uh, that makes possible to provide access to the final consumer to electricity with an installation in uh, with low consumption so this is a very good spot we use our lead lamps etc so uh, for 1000 cfa francs about two dollars so one 1.5 euros so this is doable with a funding mechanism with grants with the support of donors all and the connection is refunded in the longer term with an energy which remains a low cost for the consumer Thank you. Thank you so, much. Uh, so I think I think what you said is actually quite important especially what you said earlier on, right? um, people are interested in renewables and they are interested in getting con connected and I think we need to just think outside the box and it's not necessarily just going through the traditional um, processes of connecting people we can actually do off-grid and you know renewables is actually perfect for that but also innovation in terms of reducing losses um, is also a major contribution contributor to to us um, reducing our carbon footprint thanks <coughs> as it's less expensive. Oui. So affordability is, uh, is really a challenge here. Of course. Um, Mamadou, coming back to you. As a company that is traditionally known for their engines, how is Watsila's product development focused on new areas like gas, solar, renewables, storage and complements? I'm assuming that you're not going to go out of business, so you must be thinking about all of this stuff. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think we, we, we make our strategy, and you, you might love but our vision for the future is to enable 100 percent renewable world. This is our vision at Varsila uh, that we have. And, uh, but I come back to France to be more um, following my promise. Uh, we believe that Varsila has to play a very pivotal role for energy transition, the energy transition. In a 100 percent green world doesn't mean that we'll only be having solar and wind energy. We, uh, we have to be realistic. We need to have an uh, energy mix. Um, uh, so how this uh, energy mix can work? We need to have some flexibility. In other words, flexibility will allow to do what I was saying earlier on, that demand equaled consumption. And an electric grid is a dynamic, is a vibrancy, it's a network, it's a grid. It's not something very simple. It's a complexity thing that will allow having an energy we, to be consumed. So the error that we see is that we have l lots of financial institutions that do not want to fund things that are not renewable. This is not going to work. Why? Just because renewables will depend on um, nature and forecast uh, demands of people cannot be correlated or connected to uh, sunshine um, or wind production, etc. Uh, in Varsila, we do believe that we're capable of uh, allowing that kind of vers uh, versatility, flexibility, so that demand can be met, despite the variability and the intermittency, intermittency of renewables. Still, we're in the solar energy. We've installed a um, solar solution in Burkina Faso. We have a hybrid solution in Senegal, and uh, we're now investing 
in technology that can allow to retrieve COT pieces on our offices or we can produce energy. So we, as a company, we're trying to invest in renewable energy. We also want to recall the world that um, moving toward renewable, which is a fact, hard fact, this doesn't mean that the world will only be using panels and wind solutions because the needs will not be um, based on the availability of intermittent energies. The needs are connected to time frames, uh, demands of production, and of course we'll be having solutions uh, that are flexible enough and that will allow that kind of transition. So Varsila, our company, is um, embarking in a dynamic that will allow such transition. We do believe that the world will move toward 100% uh, renewable and this doesn't mean that we will be having um, uh, only be having installation of wind or solar grids. We will absolutely be having technical solutions that will allow ensuring the intermittency and security. You talked about uh, we need to secure, we need security, we'll have a low cost. Also, we need to have an energy system or electrical system that function. We we're talking about an electrical system. It's not just having panels at home or in a grid that will uh, generate energy, um, etc. There are dynamics. Etc. It's a complex thing. I believe that as Seneca and, and Senegal, they have uh, really uh, they're conducting studies that are very uh, pivotal. As I said in my remarks, we believe that each and every country, each and every grid, has to conduct studies, has to produce their own models, and see what's the best approach in order to connect the three parameters. So we touch upon the cost, availability, and equality in accesses to access to energy. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it sounds like the, the next wave of evolution is really storage to make sure that we can actually use renewables to the max. And I am seeing Veronica standing right in front of me. I think she's giving me a timer. <laughs> am I over time? Am I, are we supposed to all get off the stage now? Every, everything has been wonderful. The microphone. We should make some waves and we should get moving if it's okay with you. Linda, may I collect two reflections from the audience, but I will be robbing your speakers of the final word. Would it be okay? Can we give the final word to the people? I think it'd be good to hear from, from, from the audience. And yes. maybe we can give Raja just one final word because she didn't have a second question. Just one minute. Raja, very yeah. quick word. I, I think my own uh, point of all of this is simply that you know, we are here today and we talk a lot about um, innovation um, and um, ideas. And I think one of the things we forget to talk about is the burden of innovation and the burden of idea factories on the public sector. And it is one of the big, I mean, everybody has an idea. I mean, I, I don't know, I've been in the public sector and uh, our colleague here was talking about choices. Most people don't come to the public sector with choices. They come with ideas and innovation. And the extraordinary burden that places on the public sector to choose between what Silla advised, the BP advised, the Shell advice, Actus advice, Yatra advice. And I think we really do need to take a moment to say, uh, you know, are we part of the uh, the solutions are with the governments, as today the Senegalese minister was saying today about, uh, they have a development plan, they have a vision, they have a time frame for those, they have budgets. So uh, how much of our effort uh, or our ideas or innovation is actually linked to any of that national vision, development and ideas? Or are we just creating products and services that are delinked from that overall goal of that stakeholder management. And I think that is something we don't talk enough of, and I hope in the coming days or so that we really talk about that and how, how do you fit into that world. And that's pretty much what we are now trying to uh, say to most governments that we work with is saying, products are not developed in vacuum, services are not developed in vacuum, you know, what is it tailored to do that? So I'd like everybody to kind of think about that, the burdens that we place with our innovations and our ideas on the public sector that has 60 million people or 100 million people to meet their needs. Thank you. Some great food for thought there. Um, and yeah, if we can all take that away. And as we come up with our ideas and innovations, let's think about what we're asking of our counterparts. 
um, maybe audience a couple of questions if could I suggest a reaction a reflection because your questions will not be answered in this moment although we have two more days together so they will be addressed at some point a quick reaction yes please another one over here yes we'll take these three Thank you. Khadija Senmoro from Burkina Faso. I'll be speaking in French, so please. Uh, thank you for your submission, uh, your input. Personally, I would like to draw the attention on the role of SMEs and SMIs for access to power in my country, Burkina Faso. In my country, Burkina Faso, we have about 3% of access to electricity in rural settings. And the zone which is characterized by a very low density. Um, when we talk about access to electricity through a grid, this uh, means that we have to invest a lot in the grid. With lots you're talking about, I think, for a zone like those, the proposition would be to move toward a solar system of the off grid system with a solar off system. Well, also with standalone systems. And why not have a mini grid for productive systems? Thank you so much. We have two more, yes. Oui, uh, bonjour. Good morning, Omar Wale from Mauritania. Well, we talked a lot about energy transition. We put focus on the production of energies in general, but what concerns us now? the small promoters we are, or small entrepreneurs, or average citizens, what we're concerned of is um, the level of use of those energies. We know that, as I speak, in our various countries, in developing countries, will be uh, needing housing. Those homes will be built using classical materials. These are materials that use lots of energy and we know that um, population growth will be having lots of more uh, pollution and more energy demand. My question is today, or rather, in years to come, uh, don't you think that we will be having the same level of uh, pollution, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, as compared to develop, um, in de developed countries? So I've um, appreciated the Mr. Mamadou, what he had to say. He said that to define uh, production, we need to see and reflect and cross fertilize on the on the demand on energy etc so this is a question i'm asking myself evaluation of materials etc thank you uh, comment yeah Thanks. thank you merci beaucoup uh, thank you well i wanted to put focus on one little piece when we talk about energy transition I believe that we have to really specify things because uh, energy transition in the north, in developed countries, uh, this cannot be the same in southern hemisphere. This creates lots of problems um, when we talk about the response in terms of equity, access, in terms of efficiency, and in terms of uh, sustainability. And the pace of transition is very vital, is very important, and the profile also is of systems. It's also very important. I'd like to put focus on, or rather, when we talk about the case of transportation systems, it's been addressed um, initially in, by many panel members. Well, here yeah, there's a response to the needs for mobility, generally in the north, um, which is a response, which is a response driven. Um, driven by uh, public incitations, incentives, but also because um, uh, through um, innovations, etc., response to demand, but incentives for, um, for new demand, reprofiling new demand uh, via the development of electrical cars, for example, or the conversion to electricity. So uh, first problem, the recycling. Very rapidly, very rapidly, I'll conclude the recycling of of the automobile park in north. 
this will be done in the south, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so this is a big chunk, a big problem. At the same time, there's mates demands in the south. We have an improvement in access to automobiles, but also in, and also because of the fact of urbanization, you know that Africa will be the main marketplace for cars. And um, so, how can we meet? Uh, can, can we address this globally through cooperation at the internet level? How we can access the improvement of access to, to mobility? For example, there's a transition which was done in the south in, in the field of transportation. When pedestrians have money to buy a car, they will uh, buy a motorcycle. Gradually, I see that in that kind of Senegal. But in the past, you know, um, uh, Senegalese nationally didn't like really uh, driving motorcycles. And then when they have more money, they will buy cars. But they uh, think about diesel. You know, taxis you use here are using diesel. So this, you have an issue of sustainability and also access for access. Thank you. Sir, merci. Uh, thank you, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Bear with me. Sure. And we'll discuss it plus. But We'll come back to that later on, maybe in further discussions. The burden of innovation, and I'm afraid I have the burden of timekeeping, because you have been incredibly patient. You've shown remarkable endurance and passion, but we have other places to get to, more conversations to have. In fact, we want to move into some smaller conversations where we have more time to debate and discuss and respond to each other. So if you will please excuse me, I will need to begin that process. Linda, I'd like to give you one final word, and then I have some very important information to share with folks. Thanks, Veronica. I think we could talk about this topic all day. So, you know, grab any of the panelists during the breaks, have a chat, you know, reach out to any of the people in IFC if you have, you know, a really burning thought that you would like to leave with us. We're very open to hearing your views and your suggestions. But um, I think what the two words that I leave with all of you is responsible transition. And that is for all of us, um, government, developers, lenders, and ourselves as individuals. And I just want to say thank you so much to the panelists. You were fantastic. Thank you so much, all. And again, please forgive me, because I know people are dying to hear more from you. But as we talk about responsible transitions, I am responsible for this transition. We're going to leave this room. Congratulations. You made it 